Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us on our uh, first annual science symposium. I'm going to talk about our research programs. And um, obviously, we conduct our research, we publish everything in peer reviewed journals, we communicate our science, and then we apply it to our safety assessment program. The research program is um, efficient, uh, it's strategic, and it's proactive as well as reactive. Proactive in that we want to look forward to see what our needs are in the future, uh, what we think we might need. And it's also reactive because we're looking at some of the concerns that science has, that our membership has, and to be able to um, react to those and help uh, our other scientists and members. Our goal is um, for our research program to be agile, um, adaptable, and changing to external needs or to re re the requirements for unintended uh, uh, consequences. And um, it has expanded in all areas in every single endpoint. And we, we want to improve the tools that we use in our safety assessment process, not only for RIFM, but for our, our members and for the scientific community at large. Our research has focused on uh, eliminating all animal testing. So we're concentrating on new approach methodologies. And something that we're quite proud of is that we've saved more than a half a million animals in using these new types of tools and using testing only as a last resort and being very strategic in our testing. Our research is also collaborative. So um, working with others helps us to make sure that we're not um, repeating anything that anyone else has done. This is a waste of time and money and effort. It also opens up new avenues of communication. And it's not only good for our own scientists, but also for others, because it brings people and organizations much closer together. And we learn from each other. In the last two years, we have really had um, record-breaking years in that not only have the number of our safety assessments increased, but also we have had 19 groundbreaking peer-reviewed research papers that have been published, something that we're quite proud of, and really adding to the scientific community at large, to RIFM safety assessment program through our research, and also for the benefit of our members. So um, I'd like to take you through some of the research projects that are, that we've been working on. And um, as you know, our scientific staff works on two complementary scientific endeavors. On the one hand, we're supporting our safety assessments, and each scientist on staff also has uh, numerous research projects that they're working on. And of course, overview of all of this is that we need exposure in order to uh, support the safety assessments. And we've had research projects enhancing our exposure techniques. And of course, then there's computational chemistry, our chemists on staff that really help us to in every single endpoint and how we do read across and the best way to approach completing that endpoint assessment. So there are um, the threshold of toxicological concern, as well as read across, continue to be strategic components to the RIFM safety assessment program. And because of that, we have put in a research in enhancing both of those tools. So for um, read across, we have organized all of the fragrance materials in the safety assessment program, including others that are not used as fragrances, but are structurally related um, and they've we've put we've clustered all of them and they really help our scientists to evaluate all the materials in the safety assessment program and to that end RIFM staff along with the expert panel have published on how we do read across and we have really learned over the last 15 years how to refine the way we cluster materials and how we read across to different materials that first publication was done at the end of 2020 and because science is always evolving and we're always learning, we now have a second read across paper that's just been accepted for publication that refines and explains how we have re, uh, we do our safety our read across. Um, 
right now we're working on a third publication, which is how we are using clustering in assessing natural complex substances or NCSs. Um, this is not so much to use read across for NCSs, but rather how our what is our approach in um, uh, assaying uh, the the NCSs and conducting the safety assessments on them. Um, just a note here that RIFM scientists interact on read across with various consor industry consor consortia. A good example of this is on the um, industry uh, consortia on salicylates. So I mentioned that how important TTC is to our safety assessment program. And um, it, it provides um, an efficient and an, a scientifically sound way to look at, uh, to evaluate lower exposure fragrance ingredients with limited toxicity data. And because it's so strategic, again, we wanted a research program to enhance the database on TTC. And we partnered with uh, the scientists at Pope Procter & Gamble to publish a paper summarizing the data that we had and add it to the database on TTC. And this was quite important because we added a considerable amount of data for those materials that are classified at Kramer class two, which previously had been data poor. In addition, on the dermal sensitization side, there's the dermal sensitization threshold or DST. And again, this provides a scientifically sound way to evaluate low exposure fragrance ingredients with limited dermal sensitization data. So if a chemical's exposure is below the relevant D, uh, DST, then sensitization is very unlikely. And this was first developed by Bob Safford when he was at Unilever, and he developed it for non-reactive materials. And then in 2011, he refined the non-reactive DST. In 2015, we collaborated with Bob Safford as well as Dave Roberts to look at the reactive DST because obviously if we wanted to use DST as a tool in our safety assessments, we needed one for reactive as well as non-reactive materials. At the same time in 2015, we published a set of rules for high potency chemicals or HPC. We don't have any high potency chemicals as a fragrance ingredient. However, in 2020, we partnered with scientists at Cal and published an HPC DST. The reason for doing that is because we were beginning to look at natural complex substances and we weren't sure if there would be a component in a natural that would be an HPC. So we wanted to have this tool available to us. And finally, this year, we partnered with the scientists at LASA to update the non-reactive, reactive, and HPC DSTs. Um, so again, this was a way to bolster the database that was used to develop a DST. Um, the original database was based on about 230 materials. We now have over 1,500 chemicals, and we know that that enhanced database still support the DST values that were uh, for all three of these um, components, non-reactive, reactive, and high potency chemical DSTs. We're also engaging with other collaborators to expand other TTC approaches. We're working with scientists from Fraunhofer Institute, the US EPA, Procter & Gamble, and Cosmetics Europe on working to expand the inhalation TTC. In addition to that, we're working with scientists from the American Chemistry Council, Cosmetics Europe and Academia to develop an internal TTC. We're also working with scientists uh, from HESI and collaborating on developing an eco TTC on fragrance materials to refine the environmental uh, risk assessment. RIFM uh, has also published a criteria document on how we will be evaluating natural complex substances. That paper has now been published and we hosted a webinar with Elsevier that occurred uh, earlier this year and is available on the Fragrance Resource Center. In case you didn't see it, you can look at the uh, webinar at your leisure from that um, Fragrance Resource Center. 
Um, RIFM's uh, research supports natural complex substances as well. Our computational chemists and the expert panel are collaborating on the NCS clustering paper. Um, we also have three really exciting projects um, on the environmental side. We're working with uh, Creatus to uh, look at the hazard assessment of naturals um, with a block approach for mixtures and unknown fractions. We also just started a research program with the Technical University of Denmark, which combines testing of NCSs with a cons a constituent specific analysis. And finally, we're still doing bioaccumulations on NCS um, components to confirm predictions of several NCSs. And later on, you're going to hear from all of our scientists on highlighting one of the research projects that they have. And you also have an opportunity during some of the breakout sessions to ask more detailed questions on any one of these research projects with our scientists. So I would encourage you to stay on and um, listen to some of the work that our scientists have done and to be able to ask them questions or any questions that you may have. Um, I mentioned that uh, exposure is really important to our safety assessment process. And uh, we have developed along with CREM Global, the CREM RIFM aggregate exposure model. And as with all scientific uh, tools, nothing is stagnant, science changes, and you need to update the tools that you use. And of course, we've also updated the tools of uh, the aggregate exposure tool. Um, we've collaborated with uh, Cosmetics Europe on uh, getting baby exposure data, and that data is now being incorporated into our model. In addition to that, we sponsored an exposure study in Singapore, and so we will have data on Singapore uh, as well as North America and, uh, Japan, and um, Europe. Um, we're looking at expanding to different regions of the world. Uh, it's really difficult to get this kind of data, and we're always looking for partners um, in the region so that we can uh, get the data on different uh, areas of the world. So the model, um, as you know, is a realistic model. Um, it's a significant enhancement from the tool that we had used previously. And the model is the most comprehensive of its kind. Um, and we know because we have surveyed all of the materials in the RIFM safety assessment program, we know that 75% of fragrance materials fall below the threshold of toxicological concern. Now, this doesn't mean that we've used TTC on 75% of the fragrance inventory, but it does mean that the exposure to fragrances is very low. And this is a, a um, theme that, or uh, an idea that we're trying to develop, and we will be publishing a manuscript to demonstrate the low exposure to fragrance materials. In addition to that, we have several manuscripts underway. One of them is um, showing how we have enhanced the model to include household products, and we're also now uh, working on manuscripts for the baby exposure as well as the uh, data from Singapore. And then on this slide, I've listed the publications on this model that are already available. And again, you can find that on the Fragrance Resource Center. There are some other exciting um, research projects in the environmental area. We're working on a, a new framework document. Our current framework is uh, going to be 20 years old, and we're, we've developed an, an enhanced framework uh, model that will allow us to incorporate new tools that are available uh, to assess the, uh, the safety in the environmental arena. We have a biodegradation project that we're working on with the US EPA, and we continue to work on in vitro skin, um, in vitro fish metabolism studies. RIFM uses alternative test methods to assess photo irritation. And earlier this year, we published with scientists from IIVS, the Institute for In Vitro Sciences, on an update to our original criteria document on how we would assess photo irritation using these new methods. In addition to that, we're working with scientists from IIVS, Shiseido, as well as Sensogen to uh, find a battery of new approach methods to, to assess photoallergenicity.
RIFM has a longstanding uh, research program in the respiratory area. We're looking at new approaches uh, to assess respiratory irritation, and more importantly, to be able to find a tool that will distinguish between respiratory irritation and uh, respiratory sensitization. We also want a tool that's going to differentiate between dermal and respiratory sensitization. We also have a program looking at odor thresholds and not only just finding where the odor threshold is, but to find out where you see that irritation. Because of course, if uh, the general public, if they can smell a certain fragrance, their assumption is that this is being used at very high concentrations. And we know that that's not the case. So we want to get the data to be able to support that and to be able to demonstrate the difference between when you can um, detect an odor, when you see the irritation, and then to compare that to the exposure, which is very much different from those three um, areas. So there are no known fragrance ingredients that are respiratory sensitizers. And um, it was really important for us, if we're going to determine a method that looks at respiratory sensitization, what are the materials that we're going to use to determine whether this model actually works? And what we found in looking at the literature, that there are many materials that are labeled um, as respiratory sensitizers. But in fact, when you look at the data, there are in fact less than 10 chemicals that were confirmed with compelling evidence that they induce respiratory sensitization in, in humans. So there really aren't that many res known human respiratory sensitizers, but it was important for us to be able to identify these materials so that if we have a new method, we have a set of materials that we can use to show that they, this method actually detects respiratory sensitization. We also have a, a, a growing research program in genotoxicity. We have uh, worked on uh, an epiderm 3D skin assay. Um, and of course, we've used uh, the blue screen assay as a screening tool only, but this has been very important in looking through all of our fragrance materials. And um, in the latter part of last year, we published all of our data on mint lactone, which was a material that was shown to show some um, genotoxicity and therefore we wanted to make sure that we published the data that we had. It was important for us for the epiderm uh, 3D skin reconstructed skin assay to help us because it can address misleading positive genotoxicity results and as you know um, most of the uh, exposure to a fragrance ingredient is still through the dermal route. We also have a genotoxicity research project that has now been added as a valuable tool to the RIFM database. And this is a nice uh, project which started out as a research project, evolved into something that only RIFM scientists use, and now is a tool for our members as well. And it's a really nice way of looking at all of our genotoxicity data and being able to look at it by material, by groups of materials, by uh, different uh, results that you'll see. So it really is quite a powerful tool and I encourage you to go on our database and try it out. In addition to that, we also are looking at uh, new approach methods for genotoxicity that will help us to minimize the rate of misleading positives went from the in vitro assays. So the problem that we have, the, the challenge that we have is if you see a positive in an in vitro assay for genotoxicity, the next step would be to look at an in vivo study. So what we're trying to do is develop methods so that we don't have to do any in vivo assays. One of those is looking at the in ovo uh, chicken egg model. Another one is a tox tracker, which is um, a unique genotoxicity assay that will help us to look at the mechanism of action. And again, I'm going to encourage you to participate in the um, breakout groups so that you can talk to our lead scientists in all of these areas um, to learn more about um, these different assays. We also have a number of studies that we've done for skin sensitization that will help us to eliminate animal testing. And if I haven't mentioned it before, I should say that 
we are not doing any animal testing for the human health endpoints. So in the dermal sensitization area, an important publication was on the quantitative risk assessment, which was an enhancement to what was published in 2008. So we call this QRA2. And this came from um, uh, a review through the IDEA project. And this was the publication uh, which incorporates an, uh, an update to the sensitization assessment factors and incorporates aggregate exposure into the QRA. We also felt it was important. We have 30 years of history in conducting um, confirmatory, no induction sensitization studies, CNIH, and that was published um, earlier uh, in the latter part of 2021. And we also have a lot of research projects looking at new approach methodologies. You can, we have one on the USENSE assay where we collaborated with scientists from L'Oreal and also the census assay. And we had two other important publications, one looking at the weight of evidence categorization. This was important because we looked at the categorization and didn't keep it to just human studies, but rather what would happen if we looked at all of the data in vitro, historical animal data, all of the human data, what would happen with the categorization? And we feel that this would help us as we use more of the new approach methods to assess the skin sensitization endpoint. And finally, an important paper from this year was the derivation of a Nestle, the no expected sensitization induction level. And um, this is important because it was a picture in time. It shows you how we are deriving a Nestle today. We fully recognize that five years from now, we're probably have to, going to have to update that as more tools become available to us. But I think it was important for us to show that we can and we do use these new approach methods in deriving a Nestle for fragrance materials. There are also a number of other skin sensitization research projects going on, and we're trying to continue the theme of using, um, of collaborating with others. So I'll just highlight a few on this page. Um, we're collaborating with scientists at Jividon to look at an analysis of very high EC3 values and what does that mean in the determination of sensitization. We are collaborating with uh, scientists from IFF to look at the guard skin dose response assay. We're collaborating with scientists from P&G to compare the DPRA with the PPRA. And we have numerous other projects that we're working on for skin sensitization. So stay tuned for more updates. One of the most challenging um, areas on trying to replace animals is in the uh, developmental reproductive area as well as systemic toxicity. And we are looking at um, an in vitro integrated organ model to assess systemic effects. And this hopefully will help us to be um, more flexible in looking at the effects in the human body and evaluating systemic uh, toxicity. Um, we also collaborated with uh, scientists from P&G to see how we would be able to use data from repeat dose toxicity studies to provide meaningful and timely, um, no adverse effect levels for the reproductive endpoints. So this method was approved by the expert panel and um, this is a tool that we're currently using. So it's another tool that we'll be able to use so that we not don't have to use any animal testing. In addition to that, um, we collaborated with other scientists at P&G to look at the um, use of read across for the cancer hazard classification. And we used the, a case study of isoeugenol and methyl eugenol. And um, it shows how we have refined the way we do read across in that you really cannot use the data from methyl eugenol to read across to isoeugenol. And this paper explains the reason why. We are using um, in vitro human skin absorption studies, and we have been for quite a long time to refine exposure of fragrance materials. We start with looking at a predicted skin absorption study, and if necessary, we conduct an in vitro uh, human skin absorption study. We're also doing these types of studies to help regulatory questions. An example of this, again, is the salicylate 
uh, project that the industry is working towards. Um, we're looking at new developmental toxicity screening tools to, um, again, uh, help identify materials to push forward during the testing pipeline. At this point, I don't think there's any method that will replace animal testing, um, but we're certainly working on new methods to see how it can help us. And we look, we're working with the uh, scientists at Stemina and the DevTox Quick Predict process. We're also uh, working with scientists at Biobide and the uh, Teratotox assay, which uses zebrafish embryos. And we're also looking at ReproTracker, which is um, a human cell-based cell assay to identify developmental toxicity. Um, in addition to all of this, we're looking at um, how physiological-based pharmacokinetic modeling, PBPK, um, to help us to, in a number of different safety assessments, um, whether that's just to enhance the read across that we want to use or to help us to replace animal testing. So PBBK modeling is a mathematical modeling to predict the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And that um, is based on, uh, you can enhance the PBBK modeling if you do have some uh, metabolism data. So I hope I've given you an overview of all of the uh, uh, research projects that are underway at RIFM. And at the end of the day, we want to ensure that the science that we conduct helps everyone to enjoy their favorite fragrance products. And again, on this slide, I'm going to give you the site for the Fragrance Material Safety Resource Center. I encourage you to go on that site and uh, put your email address in so that you get updates to the site. And it's a way to um, get download any of the documents, any of the publications that we have. Of course, if you can't find them, we would be happy to supply you with a copy. And I'll be happy to take um, any questions uh, that you might have in the chat or when we go to the breakout uh, groups. But I'd also like to turn this over now to my colleagues at RIFM who can highlight there are uh, some of the research projects that I've outlined in this presentation. As Anne-Marie mentioned, we have a lot of exciting projects and research ongoing in our environmental department. And I'll need to briefly present them to you, especially one of them. My name is Aurelia Lapchinsky, and I'm the principal scientist managing the environmental program. But before we get into details, I just want to remind you that you can ask questions at any time using the question or chat function, and I will try and answer them there. Any questions, we do not get to it. I'll be more than happy to address in a breakout session dedicated specifically to environmental research. But before we do that, let's just take a look at all of them very briefly. Let's start with our EcoTTC project. When we follow general EcoTTC approach, built under HASTI umbrella, and modify it with fragrance specific data set that we have in our RIFM database to see how this approach can fill out the data gaps and eliminate unnecessary testing. Next, we have a chances to project when we're developing a method to evaluate natural complex substances by breaking them into physically chemically related blocks, for example, soluble, non soluble, or inner blocks. We are conducting in vivo studies on the individual blocks as well as the whole block and oil, and the results from these are compared to in silico predictions. Following chances two, we have another NCS project where we're looking at developing and modifying methods using biodegradation and degradation assessment of NCSs. We have another very in very interesting RIFM biodegradation project when we are analyzing trends in biodegradation when it comes to fragrance materials. We're looking at the data set of biodegradation studies that we have in our database, and we are comparing these results with in predictive models, for example, bioins. And finally, we have the RIFM framework project, and this project I wanna discuss in a little bit more details. 
So Riven framework has been the backbone of our risk assessment for the last 20 years. And although it is still a valid approach, we thought that a lot has changed since 2003 and it's time to modify the way we are evaluating our materials. So the first major update is to expand our framework beyond US and North America with addition of Asia Pacific and South America regions. This is to align with the information that we are obtaining from IFLA volume of your survey. We also make sure, want to make sure that we are using the most updated information in regards to population and water use. So we are going to be using the information that's publicly available through World Bank. We also incorporating the improvements in in silico and in vivo and in vitro science. And we are looking on how we can incorporate this new advanced methodology in approaches in assessment and environmental risk assessment, how we can apply them in RIFM framework. And as just as we have in our current framework, the goal of it, risk assessment, is to compare the predicted environmental concentration and to predicted no effect concentration. So these are the projects in a nutshell. Thank you for taking your time. I encourage you to attend the environmental science and research breakout session where I will be available to discuss these projects and answer any questions you may have. In addition, there are poster link, posters linked to this session. There's actually three projects, posters on uh, EcoTTC framework and NCSs available for you to look at. And now let me introduce my colleague, Gretchen, who will talk about phototoxicity. Thank you, Aurelia. Greetings, everyone. My name is Gretchen Ritako, and I manage the photo irritation and photo allergy endpoints at RIFM. Today, I want to talk briefly about our research program. RIFM's photo safety research program focuses on new approach methodologies to evaluate photo allergy. As you may already know, whereas photo irritation is analogous to skin irritation, photo allergy is analogous to skin sensitization with UV exposure required for the skin reaction to occur. It is an immune mediated event. It should be noted that the stepwise testing paradigm that we have for photo irritation is not appropriate for evaluation of photo allergy. The good news is that unlike photo irritation, photo allergy is considered a rather uncommon event. However, historically, fragrance photo allergens have been banned, so it is important for us to consider it. The issue we have is that lacking available data when a material absorbs in the UV or visible light range, which is the first step for any photo allergy reaction, we do not currently have a testing paradigm to fully assess its photoallergenic potential. And we have about 100 fragrance materials that fall into this category. In the past, animal studies were conducted, but there were no guideline studies. Most CROs do not offer these studies. They are expensive, and there was never a gold standard protocol for running these studies. Human studies were also conducted in the past, but we no longer consider these studies because, again, there are no guidelines. Additionally, these studies are considered unethical because of persistent light reactors or people who, in essence, become allergic to UV light. Through collaborations, we are determining if in vitro assays for skin sensitization can be modified with a UV exposure step to evaluate photoallergy. And our partners for these collaborations are Shiseido and IIVS for the photo direct peptide reactivity assay, or DPRA, the photo keratinescence assay, and the photo human cell line activation test, or HCLAT. We are also working with a company called Sensagen, investigating a modification of their guard skin assay for photo allergy. The assays we are investigating are well established in the skin sensitization space and each addresses a specific key event in the adverse outcome pathway or a combination of key events as shown in this graphic. We anticipate that 
it will be unlikely to have a standalone assay for photoallergy, but more likely we'll use a combination of assays to provide us with information on the likelihood of fragrance materials presenting a concern for photoallergy. This work has been underway for some time, and I encourage you to check out my poster, which summarizes preliminary data from our collaboration with Sensogen. Thank you for your attention, and I would now like to introduce my colleague, Nikita, who will talk about respiratory research. Thank you, Gretchen. So, as Anne-Marie mentioned, respiratory research is presently engaged on four fronts. There is one poster that summarizes the RIFM respiratory program, and there are two other posters, that one of which will provide details on the respiratory irritation project, and the other one will provide information on the review of known respiratory sensitizers that shows that there are no fragrances that are known respiratory sensitizers. In this talk, I will briefly elaborate on the other two areas of respiratory research, the odor threshold and the inhalation TTC. Due to the unique order and properties of fragrance compounds, the, it takes a very small amount to impart an odor to a product. This means the amount exposed when smelling the product is even smaller. To confirm this, we have partnered with Monel to establish odor thresholds and odor irritation thresholds in humans for fragrance materials. The data obtained from this project will help us compare the odor thresholds with the inhalation TTC limits and the in vivo NOAC values, thus establishing that if you smell something, the exposure is not necessarily high and effectively separating sensory irritation from the irritant effects in the respiratory tract. We use the exposure-based waving approach for inhalation exposure safety evaluation of fragrances by applying inhalation TTC when chemical-specific toxicity data are not available. We know that the inhalation exposure for over 99% of the materials in our inventory are below the most conservative Creamer Class 3 inhalation TTC limit of 470 micrograms per person per day. This limit was established by Carthew et al. in 2009. Because of its strategic importance, RIFM started a project in collaboration with Procter & Gamble to support the Carthew's methodology and move beyond the fragrance space. Initially, the main objective was to increase the data set and the chemical space of the inventory. Later, we also started probing a better classification system, which would be relevant for local respiratory effects assessment by separating the local and the systemic effects NOAC and considering the physical and chemical properties of the compounds. We managed to increase the inventory to 246 compounds, which was more than twice of that of Carthew's 92. And by using the machine learning methods, we have identified three to five clusters for classifying this inventory. More recently, other methods were developed for deriving the inhalation TTC values, and all were established for specific application purposes. Identifying the need to harmonize these data sets and enhance the existing derived limits, we are collaborating with Cosmetics Europe, US EPA, Fraunhofer, and Procter & Gamble. For more discussion, I will be joining Dan and Koshal in the breakout session after this talk. Thank you for your attention, and now I would like to introduce my colleague, Yax Tucker, who leads the Gene Talks Endpoint at Rhythm. Thank you, Nikita, for introducing me. Hi, everyone. My name is Yax Tucker, and I lead the Genetic Toxicology Endpoint here at Rhythm. Today, I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of animal alternative models uh, to evaluate genotoxic potential of fragrance materials and the importance of that. I'm just going to be giving you a brief introduction uh, of what the methods are in order to know the details about the methodology and the work that we have done. Feel free to come to my poster for more questions and detailed methodology and any, any additional details that you would like to know about the assays. Now, before we jump into the assays, I'd like to start with basics. What is considered as genotoxicity? Whenever there is a DNA damage, 
Usually there is error-free DNA repair, which does not lead to any genotoxicity, uh, and there is no cancer uh, at the, as an end result if there's error-free DNA repair. However, if there is no slash faulty DNA repair, it may lead to either gene mutation, or it may lead to chromosomal damage, or uh, change in number of chromosomes, which is also called as classogen antigen. In order to evaluate genotoxic potential of any fragrance chemical, we have to evaluate two separate endpoints. That's the strategy that we follow here at Trifum. Uh, we have separate battery of assays addressing each endpoint, which is muta gene mutation, as well as clostridium acid and eugen acid. Uh, in order to evaluate genotoxic potential from both mutagenicity as well as clastrogenicity standpoint, we follow a battery of assays. And this is a testing scheme or testing paradigm that we usually follow to evaluate genotoxic potential of fragrance chemicals. On the left-hand panel, the decision tree is for mutagenicity. On the right-hand panel is for clastrogenicity. The top part in the green highlighted here are the in vitro models which are regulatory approved and the bottom part is in, are the in vivo animal models which are approved by regulators to evaluate uh, genotoxic potential. Post SACS 7th Amendment, there has been a ban on animal testing for uh, chemicals used in consumer product industry. Hence, this, the testing schema which I just presented uh, limits us only to use in vitro battery. The major drawbacks that the current in vitro models has is it produces significant amount of misleading slash false positives, and it also lacks sufficient phase two detoxification enzymes since does, it does not have live liver differentiating tissue, even though we add SN, it does not have full capacity for glutathione, uh, glutathione conjugation and few other phase two enzymes. Hence, there is a need for more animal alternative models, uh, which can address the misleading outcomes that we observe in the current in vitro models. In addition to that, it's more uh, it's more important that we have models which are more relevant to the route of exposure of the final product that we are planning to use. Hence, we are we are evaluating a 3D skin model for all the dermally applied products and for any oral ingestion or flavoring agent or lip product, which is considered to be 100% orally bioavailable as per SACS, we are planning, to, we, uh, we suggest to use Hennig micronucleus, which is a live differentiating liver. And it is considered as a, an a animal alternative model. And the details are in the um, poster that I'll be presenting later on. Hence, we are trying to propose uh, utilizing these two models uh, as a follow-up to positive outcome or misleading outcome in the traditional in vitro micronuclear study, which assesses clastrogenic potential of fragrance chemicals. So uh, it, this is the right-hand schema of the decision tree that I presented on the first couple of slides. Uh, if we get a positive outcome in the in vitro model, we are proposing based on the uh, application of the chemical and what was the reason for that chemical being positive? What are the phase two enzymes involved? It will be a more informed decision whether to use chicken egg, hen egg micronuclear study or a 3D skin micronuclear study. And based on the outcomes from all these assay, we can uh, confidently make final outcome for genotoxic potential of fragrance chemical. Thank you. At this point, I would like to transfer it over to my, to my colleague. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Dan Selechnik, and I'll be talking to you about Rifm's collaboration with IonTox, using NAMS to address repeated dose toxicity data gaps. As animal studies are increasingly phased out, new approach methodologies, or NAMS, are needed to fill remaining data gaps. The Human Dynamic Multi-Organ Plate, or the HUDMOF, is an in vitro platform able to simulate distribution and metabolism across multiple organs. Although the organs that can be tested are flexible, for this project, we are looking at intestine, liver, and kidney. The project comprises several experiments with different objectives, with the first being to determine nonspecific adsorption of the test substance to the materials that make up the system. To measure this, the test substance is first run through three, the three-chambered system in the absence of any cells. Its movement is tracked over 24 hours, and recovery is determined at the end to ensure that the material does not get stuck to any of the surfaces. 
To further reinforce this objective, protein binding to the chambers is also checked using bovine serum albumin, or BSA, for an incubation period of one hour. The next experiment sets out to determine intestinal absorption and cytotoxicity. The test substance is applied to the intestinal chamber, now equipped with an epithelial cell monolayer. Movement of the test substance across the monolayer is used to determine the permeability coefficient. Cytotoxicity is measured in a similar manner. Basically, the substance is once again applied to the intestinal chamber with the cell monolayer, but this time there are electrodes placed on either side of the monolayer to measure changes in electrical resistance. If the transepithelial electrical resistance, or TIR, is significantly decreased after the addition of the test substance, it is indicative of cell damage. Cytotoxicity can be further assessed by mixing the test substance in media with cells and performing an LDH activity assay. If the substance is cytotoxic, it may cause cells to leak an enzyme called LDH, which will catalyze a reaction that produces a red color in the media that can be measured. After those preparatory steps, the test substance can finally be run through the system, complete with cells from the intestine, liver, and kidney. The movement will be tracked by measuring the concentration of test substance in each chamber at several time points over 48 hours. Now here are some results from one of our pilot materials, Coumarin. After experiment one, you can see from panel A that we had over 100% recovery of Coumarin after 24 hours in the system with no cells. Panel B shows that it distributed across all of the organs, but predominantly in the intestine. Next are the results from experiment two. Intestinal permeability of Coumarin increases with concentration and time. And at a concentration of 10 micromolar, it is clearly able to penetrate the intestinal cell monolayer after just one hour. Moving on to cytotoxicity, you can see from panel A that there were no significant changes to tear after two hours of exposure to Coumarin, regardless of the concentration. Panel B shows no changes to cell viability measured from the LDH assay. Finally, we can see the movement of Coumarin through the intestine, liver, kidney, and simulated blood over 48 hours. These pharmacokinetic data can be used in physiologically based pharmacokinetic, or PBBK, modeling to predict ADME information and more. Through multi-organ sampling, the hood map may have potential to provide more, the more realistic insights into ADME than other in vitro tests. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in more information about the hood map, a poster is available in the exhibit hall. Up next, Koshal will discuss new developmental toxicity screening tools. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. I'll be now talking about developmental and reproductive research here at Refirm and sharing the same slide that Anne-Marie had uh, early on in her presentation. Now, new developmental toxicity screening tools uh, might help safeguard future generations by identifying which material to push forward in testing pipelines. For development and reproductive toxicity area, right now we are heavily dependent on animal testing. There are no in vitro uh, regulatory approved assays for this particular uh, toxicological area. And for that reason, the idea is to explore uh, any new options or in vitro uh, assays that we probably can use it in for the future. The idea is to do some pilot studies on some materials and get some information on how these assays act and probably compare them to some of the materials which already have in vivo uh, analysis which has been done on those materials. And for that reason, we are exploring some options as mentioned in this slide. Uh, for example, uh, Seminas DevTalks Quick Predict Assay. Now, you, research on human pluripotent cells has been considered as promising animal-free approach and Steminas DevTox Quick Predict Assay is an exposure-based 
prediction of the developmental toxicity potential using human pluripotent cells. Next, we are also looking into the ReproTracker assay, which is human uh, induced pluripotent stem cell based biomarker assay. Again, that will be used for screening of developmental toxicity. Apart from these two assays, uh, we are also exploring Biobytes Teratodox assay. Zebrafish has been a well-known model for developmental toxicity in the past few decades now. Biobytes Teratodox assay basically analyzes zebrafish embryo at two and four days post fertilization for developmental toxicity and looking at specific malformations. Based on LC50, where we check the mortality, and EC50, where we will check number of abnormal embryos, a Terato index can be calculated. And based on that, we'll get some idea if the material or fragrance material is showing some kind of developmental toxicity. Now to basically conclude, uh, as mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, one in vitro test will not be able to replace uh, currently available in vivo studies for this particular uh, toxicological area, which is developmental and reproductive toxicity. Hence our idea basically is to use several tests and possibly conduct pilot studies to get basic idea on how these tests work and possibly to compare them with already available in vivo studies. With that, thank you for attending this session. We will be having a 30 minute breakout sessions for each toxicological endpoints now, where you can ask us questions if you are curious about any specific research area. So see you all soon in the breakout session next. Thank you.